OK, welcome to the first of two SY3 screencasts that are going to tackle this perspective, elite theory. And this is part of a broad topic area about the nature and distribution of power in democracy. And remember that this topic has come up in every single past exam question so far. So make sure that as we go through this screencast that you take lots of notes on elite theory. And also make sure that you've looked at the screencasts on pluralism and Marxism. Now elite theory argues that the most important decisions in society are taken by a small group, what they call the elite, and that this elite, even in a democracy, is not really accountable to the great mass of the population. The technical term for government or domination by an elite group is oligarchy. And you might be thinking that this sounds similar to the Marxist idea of a ruling class. However, unlike Marxist, elite theorists reject the idea that this ruling group is always an economic elite. Although power is often based on economic resources, as we can see in this diagram, it might also be based on other factors, and they might include the psychological characteristics of leaders, uh, their charisma, and also control of other types of organisations. For example, in a theocracy such as Iran, political power is concentrated in the hands of religious leaders. Organisational control of the military is also an important feature of political power in many societies. So elite theory seeks to reject the economic determinism of Marxism. Broadly speaking, there are two main types of elite theory. There's an older approach called classical elite theory, which I guess is politically on the right. And then there's a more left-wing perspective called power elite theory. And the key difference is that in classical elite theory, elite rule is seen as being inevitable and maybe even a desirable feature of social existence. Whereas in the more left-wing version, power elite theory is seen as something that can be changed and is something which is seen as regrettable rather than desirable. And in this screencast we're going to focus on classical elite theory. OK, the two names most closely associated with classical elite theory are Pareto and Mosca, and these were Italian political theorists from the early part of the 20th century, and their argument was that in all types of societies, no matter how civilised, so even in a democracy, there are basically always going to be two classes of people. There's a class that rules, and then there's a class that is ruled. So from this perspective, the socialist or communist idea of a classless society is never going to work. In all societies, political power ends up being concentrated in the hands of a minority group. And drawing upon the work of Machiavelli, Pareto suggested that elite rulers tend to fall into two psychological types. Firstly, there are what he calls the lions. And these are the strong leaders whose domination over the masses is typically achieved through coercion and violence. And then there are what he calls the foxes. And these are political leaders who tend to be more manipulative, more calculating, more imaginative, and it's this psychological type that is more suited to a democratic system. Now Pareto and Mosca's argument that in every type of society there are two classes, you've got the rulers and then the people who are being ruled, puts them in agreement with the work of another sociologist called Robert Michaels. And Michaels believed that in every type of organisation and in every type of political system, uh, a small group will become the oligarchical leaders and then the others will follow this ruling group. And he referred to this famously as the iron law of oligarchy. The iron law of oligarchy existed, Michaels argued, because elites tend to have greater expertise and better organisational skills than the masses. And this meant that Michaels was sceptical about democracy. From Michaels' perspective, democracy was essentially an illusion. 
uh, a disguise that concealed the oligarchic tendencies that lied beneath. So for classical elite theorists, rule by a small minority and oligarchy is a constant feature throughout history. Even after a political revolution, the only thing that changes is the faces of the leaders, but rule by a small group of some kind continues. So in the early part of the 20th century, Russia was ruled by a small group, an oligarchy, the royal family. And then in 1917, there was a Bolshevik revolution. But after that revolution, we just saw a new elite emerge, the leaders of the Communist Party. And we could argue that even now, even though they have elections, Russia continues to be ruled by a small group of leaders. So the history of modern Russia neatly fits this classical elite theory idea of the never-ending circulation of political elites. And this is a contrast to the optimistic view of revolutionary political change that's built into Marxism. From the perspective of classical elite theory, uh, revolutions don't change anything. As George Orwell writes at the end of Animal Farm, 12 voices were shouting in anger, and they were all alike. No question now what had happened to the faces of the pigs. The creatures outside looked from pig to man, and from man to pig, and from pig to man again, but already it was impossible to say which was which. So I think classical elite theorists wouldn't be in the least bit surprised that the early promise of the Arab Spring has not been realised, that there are still uh, political elites, such as the military, who haven't really uh, let go of their power in countries such as Egypt. Now, in addition to arguing that oligarchy or rule by an elite is inevitable, there are some classical elite theorists who also argue that rule by an elite group is also a good thing, that it's a desirable feature of social existence to keep power with a minority rather than giving it to the masses. Now, this idea that elite rule might in fact be desirable is based on the belief that we should leave politics to a cultured, educated, rational elite who are assumed to be much better than the masses who are portrayed as being irrational, uh, ignorant and apathetic. In other words, it is more civilised to have society controlled by uh, an educated elite rather than by the mob. And this kind of view goes back to the work of the ancient Greek philosopher Plato, who rejected the idea of democracy in favour of a belief in uh, rule by a class of benign philosopher kings who could tell everybody else what to do. Now, classical elite theory has been criticised. It's been criticised for being too simplistic, and particularly for not making any distinction between different types of political systems. So according to classical elite theory, all political systems are essentially the same. And this means that the real genuine differences between uh, democracies and authoritarian regimes are dismissed. They're all regarded as oligarchies. And secondly, this kind of argument that uh, political elites are superior to the masses is just an assertion. Um, there's no objective criteria being provided uh, by which we could measure the so-called superior qualities of elites. If you want to find out more about classical elite theory, then use your Power Revisited handout to make additional notes. And in the second screencast on elite theory, we're going to focus our attention on this more left-wing version called Power Elite Theory that's particularly associated with the work of C. Wright Mills.